அவர்கள் அவர்களை நோக்கி மனுஷ குமாரன் மகிமைப்படும் படியான வேலை வந்தது மெய்யாகவே மெய்யாகவே உங்களுக்கு சொல்லுகிறேன் கோதுமை மணியானது நிலத்தில் விழுந்து சாகாவிட்டால் தனித்திருக்கும் சித்ததையாவில் மிகுந்த பலனை கொடுக்கும் தன் ஜீவனை சிநேகிக்கிறவன் அதை இழந்து போவான் இந்த உலகத்தில் தன் ஜீவனை ஒருக்கிறவனோ அதை நித்திய காலமாய் காத்து கொள்ளுவார் ஒருவன் எனக்கு ஊழியம் செய்கிறவனால் என்னை பின்பற்றி வர கணவன் நான் எங்கே இருக்கிறேனோ அங்கே என் ஊழியக்காரனும் இருப்பார் ஒருவன் எனக்கு ஊழியம் செய்தால் அவனை கிதாவானவர் கனம் பண்ணுவார் இப்பொழுது என் ஆத்மா கலங்குகிறது நான் என்ன சொல்லுவேன் விதாவே இந்த வேளையில் நின்று என்னை ரட்சியும் என்று சொல்வேனோ ஆகிலும் இதற்காகவே இந்த வேளைக்குள் வந்தேன் பிதாவே உமது நாமத்தை மகிமைப்படுத்தும் என்றார் அப்பொழுது மகிமைப்படுத்தினேன் இன்னமும் மகிமைப்படுத்துவேன் என்கிற சத்தம் வாரத்தில் இருந்து உண்டாயிற்று அங்கே நின்று கொண்டிருந்து அதை கேட்ட ஜனங்கள் இடி முழக்கம் உண்டாயிற்று என்றார்கள் ஒரு சிலர் தேவதூதன் அவருடனே பேசினான் என்றார்கள் இயேசு அவர்களை நோக்கி இந்த சத்தம் என் நிமித்தம் உண்டாகாமல் உங்கள் நிமித்தமே உண்டாயிற்று இப்பொழுதே இந்த உலகத்துக்கு நியாய தீர்ப்பு உண்டாயிருக்கிறது இப்பொழுதே இந்த உலகத்தின் அறிவதை புறம்பாக தள்ளப்படுவார் நான் பூமியில் இருந்து உயர்த்தப்பட்டிருக்கும் போது எல்லாரையும் என்னிடத்தில் எடுத்து கொள்ளுவேன் என்றார் தாம் இவ்விதமான மரணம் மறிக்க போகிறார் என்பதை குறித்து இப்படி சொன்னார் ஆமே வேத வாசிக்கு நூற்று Thank you so much. Let's pray. <coughs> Jesus, thank you for your word to us. Thank you for your presence here with us. Please continue to fill us with your Holy Spirit. We will hear your voice speaking to our hearts. Amen. I'm just going to adjust this so I'm not cutting my head off. Um, <laughs> So Jesus says, unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it will never grow, it will never bear fruit. So uh, this made me think about seeds. And I, I've got to be honest, uh, as a boy growing up in this country, I'm no good at gardening. Gardening is hard work. You have to do weeding and you have to keep doing it every day. No. What I liked was conkers. So, Ali, could you scroll down? I, have, I think I have a picture. <coughs> have, you, have you blanked the screen? <coughs> For some reason today, all of the technology is really struggling. There we go. That was what I wanted. That's a conquer. So, officially, it's called a horse chestnut. Uh, so you see them in, in some of the parks, the, the green spiky shell. Um, but growing up, this was the only seed that I was interested in. They come in the autumn, and we would go and collect lots of them. Could the next slide be that? And I know one more, then one more. 
that's it. And this is why we wanted them. Because we would play conkers. And so you would have to take a skewer from uh, my mum's kitchen drawer, and we would make a hole in the conker, and then you would put the string through, tie a knot, and then you would have a conker, a horse chestnut, on a string. And you would take it to school, and then you would have to, you would hold it in your hand like that, with the string in this hand, Someone else would hold their conga up on the end of their string and you would whack it as hard as you could. And if you missed, it was their turn. And you did this until one conga broke, like this one on the screen. So as you can see, it was basically violence that the school allowed because there was nature involved. And there was all sorts of stories that if you put them into the oven and you bake them, they got harder. Uh, if you soak them, you put them in a glass with vinegar, they would get harder uh, and then you could, you could win. And every time your conquer won, it would, it would become a, a one-er. It won again, it became a two-er. And so you had a conquer. This one's a 15-er, as, as in, it had won 15 battles. But the theory was, if you beat someone else's, you've got to take on their number of wins. So if someone has a conquer that has been through 28 fights, and they're very proud of their 28er, and it's got cracks all the way down, you could just come and go, I have a 29er! <laughs> um, oh, so exciting. Um, probably more about that another day. But it meant that every September was a desperate search for the best conquer. You had to find someone that, that wasn't too big. If it's too big, it's an easy target for someone to hit. It has to be quite small, but it has to be shiny. You think maybe if it's shiny, their conquer will slide off, and it was like, I have no idea. Could you go back up one? But it meant that I would collect shopping bags full of conkers. And I go, oh, maybe this one, maybe this. Actually, putting it on the string, putting the skewer through, that was a lot of work. So by the time I was 10 or 11, most of the time I collected a huge bag, and then the bag stayed in my room. And it's like, I took, I did one conker, and that was it, it was like, okay, I'm tired now. But I didn't want to throw them out. They're, they're, Horse chestnuts, the conkers, they're smooth and they're shiny. And I said, oh, occasionally two grow together, and then when you take them apart, they're completely flat. Where they look like almost like a table. I was like, oh. So I would keep them, oh, this is beautiful, I love them. And so I would keep it in my room. Um, and my mum would say, When you throw those out, we, you need to get me like, No, no, they're my conkers. I can't throw them out, they're, they're mine, they're beautiful. They're... And so I would keep them. My room was not big. The bag was always fairly close to the radiator. And so normally sometime after Christmas, before I went back to school in January, my mum would say, okay, toys away, everything cleared up, tidy, ready for going back to school. And my mother would discover the plastic bag and it would smell. But then, yeah, lots of things smelled in my room. But it, once you opened the bag, it would smell. And it was mouldy. My beautiful conkers. And now they were full of mould. Now they were disgusting. And every year, heartbreak. And then in September, oh, I'm going to collect some more in a bag, in a bag, by the radiator. There you go. This is, uh, this is life. But it's a horse chest, one of those conkers. What they're meant to be. Could you go down one, please, Anna? They're meant to look like this. I mean, so like, a conquer is beautiful, but actually, this is a horse chestnut tree. The intention is the seed goes into the ground and it grows, and over many years, it becomes this. And it's like, that's beautiful, isn't it? Conquer must dream of becoming a tree like this. 
And yet some of them, they went to a plastic bag. They stayed in my room. They, they had no chance of becoming a horse chestnut. The reason I say this is because I think there is, uh, there are always things in our life that are beautiful, that we love and we think are great. But actually over time, they don't grow. They reach a point they're no longer giving life. They are no longer beautiful. So an example, when I first um, took being Christian seriously, when I was a teenager, um, the people who in the church I went to said, ah, so see, what you need, you need to have a quiet time. I was like, and you said, yeah, I'm talking too much. No, 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 see, you need a quiet time. A quiet time is when at the beginning of the day, you stop. You pray, and then you read from the Bible. You ask God to speak to you, and then you hear from God, and that will feed you. That will feed your heart, and it will allow you to serve God and do all that he's asking you to do for the rest of the day. So every day, you need to have a quiet time. So I was, I was very obedient. I very much wanted to have a quiet time. Um, some of you will know, I'm not good at sitting still. I'm even worse in the mornings. So at 17, I was trying to get up before school. It was like, okay, okay, what will I do? Okay, I'm going to read The Coming Assyrian Invasion. The Lord said to me, make a large signboard and write this name on it, Maha Shalal Hash Baz. And I was all asleep. And then I would feel awful. So, but some mornings, I would open the Bible and God would speak to me through it and I would go off to school like, yay, God's with me. I've had a quiet time. And so there were many days when starting my day reading the Bible, it was a beautiful thing. And I felt close to God. But that pattern wasn't easy for me, but it was the pattern I'd been given, so I was going to make this work. What it meant was, by the time I was 19, 20, in my head, the way that God's economy worked, the way that life worked, if I had a quiet time in the morning of between 15 and 30 minutes, God loved me and I would have a good day. If I didn't have a quiet time, God was angry with me, I had messed up uh, and I was going to have to go to God later that day and say sorry, confess, repent, and try and make things right with God. And so my Christian life was either, yay, I've had a quiet time, everything's good, or it was, oh, sorry God, I didn't do it today. Now as, God, as I got older, people said to me things like, Steve, have you tried prayer walking? What's prayer walking? It's like, well, it's kind of like a quiet time, but instead of sitting still, you go for a walk. Possibly somewhere that's green, somewhere that's somewhere that's not like I can, I can leave my house for a quiet time. And that was great. So I started walking. Uh, at the university there was a park not far from my house. And I would go and I'd walk through the trees and again, it just filled my heart. I like, God's with me. Look, I can see God in the trees. I can still, uh, as I take my Bible with me, I can hear God speaking to me through his word. Fantastic. And then later on, someone said to me, see, if you know the early Christians, they didn't do a big lump of prayer at one part of the day. Actually, they'd, they'd pray through the day. They'd have a prayer room in the morning at 6, at 9, at 12, at 3. Have you tried praying just in bits through the day so that you kind of, you feel God with you and you remember God there and you're not stop, you know, you've not got a stop clock on. I'm reading the Bible but I have to do 30 minutes or it's not good enough. So, oh, so I could just, I could just pray, read the Bible and then 
the middle of the day stop for another five minutes do that again. And so as I've gotten older, I found other ways of coming close to God. But it took a long time for me to let go the idea of the quiet time, the kind of this space first thing in the morning, where you come close to God, you read the Bible, that, that is what you have to do. Now, the quiet time is beautiful. It is a lovely thing, and I know many people, that is how they encounter God. My bishop in Birmingham was uh, John Sentinel, who went on to be Archbishop of York. Every morning, he goes and he prays before anyone else is up. And that is his pattern, that's what he does, and it feeds his spirit, and he knows that because of the way that he is, he is too busy in the day to stop and spend that time with God. He has to do it first thing. And it has worked for him, and God works through him. So that thing of the quiet time, it's like a conquer. In some people, it becomes a tree, something that flourishes, God blesses, God works through them. In me, it became moldy. I tried to hang on to this thing I'd been given, and I had to let it die so that God could uh, meet me in different ways. I could find other ways of uh, receiving from God, of learning from the Bible, other ways of praying. So the idea of seeds, it works for, uh, for how we encounter God. But also it's about how we think about things. So at university, I went to a church that was it was a huge church. There were about three, four hundred people there. And they had a program. If you were part of that church, uh, first you had to do Alpha, so Alpha, the Alpha course, which talks about the basics of Christianity. Uh, then you had to do Beta, which was the church's own course they made up of things they wanted to know about. That talked about things like giving to the church, uh, about being involved in making services happen. It covered lots of different things like that. And then they had a thing called Life Shapes, which was a course based around shapes. So there was a semicircle, there was a triangle, there was a square, there was a pen, and all of these shapes represented a principle for living as a Christian. And they were all very interesting. They were kind of, there was some of the stuff I've pinched, and we've talked about here at St. James. <coughs> but at that church, everyone went through the program. You all did it. And so when I got married to Ali, we moved to Burlington, part of a church. I said to the vicar, don't worry, I know what to do. We, we just need this program, we need this and then this and then this, and everyone does that, and it will be good. And the, the good thing for the church in Sheffield, everyone knew what was meant to happen, and everyone shared a common language. They could talk about where they were in their journey with God in reference to the programme, the thing that the, everyone in the church was doing. We got to the uh, working class estate that we were living on in Birmingham. It was like, right, so here's the programme. I was like, people didn't come to church every week. People didn't like learning things and say, right, well, it's about trying them. They're like, is this play school? Is this like kids' TV? What, what do you mean it's about a triangle? And it, it didn't work. A conquer, a beautiful thing that God had given the church in Sheffield that had become this massive tree that blessed so many people. I tried to take it to Birmingham and it went moldy. And actually, God did other things in Birmingham. And once I let my attachment to this program die, then I could see what God was doing. And I could join in with something which was exciting, which was different, which actually filled my spirit and saw what people come to know who Jesus was. Now, all of us will have seen good things in this church in other churches. They're things that bear fruit, they're things that God grows, that God blesses people through. The key thing for us is that God's kingdom is based on this principle. Life comes from death. 
And so that means we always need to be sensitive to what is God for me. What is bearing fruit? What is blessing people? And what is done? What is finished? What can we put aside to be part of what God is doing that is new and that is fresh? Now, for St. James, this is something that we all do. This is never something that Ali and I will come and say, oh, no, that's, that's done. This is what God is doing. Always God has spoken through different people. And different members of the PCC have come and said, we think God is saying this. And it's taken to, to Cafe Church and breakfast. It's brought us to this shared service and shared worship. But always we're looking. We're not saying now, oh, this is the thing. This is the conquer. This is the thing that God is going to do here, now and forever. Always we're looking for where is God bringing life? Where is God at work? And that means sometimes there are things that we think are beautiful. There are things that we are attached to and that we love. And we have to let them die. And that is, that we really hope for. But as Jesus says in his words, he is talking about a literal death. Not just the death of a preference, the death of something that he was attached to. He's talking about his own death. Say, should I say, Father, save me? Father, make this not happen? He says, no. I have come to be a sacrifice. So I will pray, Father, glorify your name. And the voice comes from heaven saying, I have glorified it. I will glorify it. Jesus knows his Father is with him in what he is doing, making this sacrifice. And so we are called to follow. Now the link to Jeremiah, there's so much more I could say, but um, we are pressed for time. God has promised that we're no longer looking at tablets of stone. We're no longer looking at bits and commandments. God's new promise with us, his new deal, is that he writes his laws on our hearts. We are each of us filled with God's Holy Spirit so that we are all sensitive to what is God doing? How is God leading us on? How is God changing? What is God going to teach us? And sometimes that means our ideas, our preferences, our desires, they have to die so that God can bring new life for us, things that will bear fruit, things that will bless us and bless those around us. So as we come to communion today, we remember Jesus' sacrifice, his death, that was made so that we could have life. And we listen to the Spirit in our hearts showing if there is anywhere in our lives where we need to stop hanging on to something that was beautiful, but whose time is back, and there is something else that God is going to grow in us. <coughs> Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you, you died so that we would have life, and life in all its fullness. Lord, continue to send your Holy Spirit and speak to us. If there's anything in our lives that was good, but it's no longer bearing fruit, Lord, would you help us to see? Help us to let go. And help us to embrace what you are doing in us and in those around us. Jesus, we ask this in your powerful name.